this is Coffee Number 5. I'm your host, Lara Schmoisman. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Coffee Number 5. My coffee's warm, and I'm ready to have a very unique conversation today because I met um, Daniel a little while ago, and he was telling me about his perfumes, and I was telling him, I wish I can try them because I suffer from migraines and I cannot put anything on my body. And I, I even had migraines going just from smelling someone next to me. And it's bad. And then he was telling me something that I didn't know, uh, that my perfumes won't give you migraines. <laughs> and I say, why is that? But I will introduce you first to Daniel Patrick Giles. And welcome to Coffee Number Thank Five. You so Thank much. you so much for being my here. My coffee's cold, but it's I've got my coffee ready. Okay. <laughs> coffee's coffee. Coffee's coffee, right. So I first have to say welcome to the Osmocosm, mm. where every scent has a story and every story has a scent. Oh, I like that. Yes. I like that. So we have a lot to talk about. I, I don't think we ever had in 170 episodes anyone talking about the perfume. And right. perfume is such a rising industry right now. I see this coming up and coming up. Are we learning from the French? Are we trying to cover something? Why? <laughs> um, I think so much changed during and after COVID. And I, I really saw a new customer emerging from COVID who really wanted to center and surround themselves in scent. It made them feel good. Um, you know, a lot of the history with fragrance is about attracting someone else. And I think there's a whole generation of people who are wearing scent for themselves, how it makes them feel, a form of self-expression. Um, that's how I've always viewed scent. But COVID, because we were so isolated during COVID, I think um, people brought scent into their home. They, you know, they use scent as a way of making themselves feel good. My COVID experience just quickly was um, I got COVID uh, pre-vaccination. I almost died of COVID. Oh, no. I lost my sense of smell during COVID. So I really have a great appreciation for scent. And my COVID experience really... You know, I was I was building perfume head a couple of years before that, but it really changed my perception on scent. And so I think how come? Uh, because I I when you lose it, if you've ever lost a, a um, you know your sight or smell or hearing, there is a a blankness that that happens that I had never experienced before. So when you went outside and you smell nothing, you, we are having a coffee, could never smell a coffee for three months. So it just, it sort of, it, it takes something really beautiful away from your life that I think we underappreciate. I think we are so inundated with scents in our life. You go into a grocery store, everything is scented laundry detergent you know, get, get into a coffee shop and smell the coffee correct can you imagine not being able to experience that no, of course. so for me it was um i just developed a much greater appreciation for scent and i think there's a real change in how people view scent how they use scent um, i see it every day there's a generation of young boys there's an article in new york times couple of weeks ago about 15 16 year old boys buying 400 fragrances wow um, yeah so it's it's become i think an identifier for people as well and one of um the things that i've really noticed being in the stores is people always try one of perfume head scent on like cosmic cowboy and then they'll say what else could i put over top of it to make it my own so there's a real sense of individuality with scent too. Well, I remember before my before migrants and that my mom was always into perfume. My dad, my brother, everyone used perfume and each one used their own that I keep using over years and years and years. Yeah. And I remember my grandmother going with a little 
put it also in strategic places. I'm yes. sure we have a lot of more knowledge now where to put the perfume to last. Yes. I'm going to ask you that question in a minute, but um, I want to understand this, the science of how create this unique sense. Uh, sense. Are you creating them based on what you like? Did you do a market research? How did you come up with those qualities and how many skills you have that it will really resonate with your target audience? Yeah, great question. So um, I'm not from the fragrance industry. I've had a career in fashion and beauty, but my passion has always been sent from a very young age. And when I decided to leave my corporate life and start this, I knew that I wanted to start a fragrance brand. I've been working on the brand almost four years before I even launched. Oh, wow. um, uh, there are nine uh, fragrances um, and when I looked at the industry sort of from the outside in, I thought it was really flat and kind of boring. It was either celebrity driven or it was driven by sort of like girl on horse trying to escape a guy, you know, these sort of silly scenarios. And so um, I have a, a collection of fragrances and I was finding it difficult to find something I loved. I found fragrances were very polarizing. Either it was really weird or just smelled like Santel 33, Baccarat Rouge, Mojave Ghost. There was a lack of originality in fragrances for me. Um, I am a product person first and foremost. Product is everything to me. I think if you, as a founder of a brand or building a brand, if you don't have great product, you're really starting at a disadvantage. And I believe that great product sustains a brand through anything and everything. And so I started my journey um, really based on where I live and what I love. So I didn't do customer research. It was really what I felt I couldn't find. Um, I live in Los Angeles. You live in Los Angeles. Yes. We're Angelinos. Um, I love living here. I think it's, um, I've lived here for over 12 years. It's a city that surprises me and delights me and disappoints me every day. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's- It's, it's a it's, love hate of living in love hate. hate, correct. Yes. And- We hate traffic. We love to have the beach, the mountain, to have correct. everything. Totally. So I started thinking about you know, what my story was going to be, what the, because I believe storytelling is the next most important thing. And I use Los Angeles as my muse mm -hmm. and sort of the favorite, my favorite places in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles is a very fragrant town. We may not like some of the smells, but it's, it, you know, there's beautiful scents here, some really not so beautiful. Um, but it also has, there's so much history here. There's so much sort of iconic things here that I really drew inspiration from. And so I really built the brand based on what I call a love letter to Los Angeles, um, places like the Chateau Marmont. I live across the street from the Chateau. I used to stay there before I lived here. I love the Chateau Marmont. Fantastic. It's got so much history. In I, it. I was about to say that. It's just the stories that that walls can tell. Okay. So when you say that, that is really um, room number is based on the stories that are embedded in the walls of the Chateau. And I worked with um, four French master perfumers um, and I created, it's almost like a, um, I see scent very cinematically. Mm -hmm. And so as I was developing the brand, I visualized, and I think it has a little bit to do with my background as a fashion director and a creative director, is I put these storyboards and poems and music and colors and, you know, tear sheets of what I wanted to achieve with each scent. Um, and the perfumers and I worked on that and they had never had, you know, you, when you, when you work with a perfumer who have, you know, th these people have decades of experience and they're trained and, you know, how do you put top uh, heart and base notes together? They're most likely given a written brief 
that is very basic. And it probably says, I want it to smell like this and these notes. And I think what, um, what happened with my experience is that I really put that into um, how I presented what I wanted to be achieved with each fragrance. You, you want more like a sensory memory. Correct, correct. And it was very sensorial in, in for them. So there's a wonderful spread in British Vogue of Margot Robbie at Flamingo Estate. She's in the pool. Then there's another shot of her with a white shirt on sitting on a leather couch in Flamingo Estate. And that was one of my tears. And um, Constance, who's one of our perfumers, she looked at the picture and she was like, oh, the green could be vetiver. The leather couch, let's put leather in it. The crispness of the white shirt, you know, let's make this a citrusy, very fresh scent. And we built it through imagery, through stories, through music, um, and created these nine beautiful scents. So basically what you're creating with this line are emotions. Correct. Correct. Very much so. It's not memories. So, you know, the memories is a huge part of the old fact of response. And I totally get all that. I have always seen scent through emotion and through, uh, it's very visual to me. It's not about, oh, my mom wore this or my dad wore this or, you know. I, this, I, I oh, love, I love that because now I feel like there are so many brands created on memories. Correct. And Correct. which is great, but memories are in the past. Right. And so I often say I like to center and surround myself in scent, which means you have to be very present and it's of the moment. Yes. Um, I, I am a big believer in not living in the past. I like living in the moment. And I think that's what I try to infuse into creating these um, fragrances. Let me ask you a question because you have this very unique combination that I have it's similar. I used to teach uh, digital media for the fashion industry. So in order to teach something, you need to understand the people who are learning or what they're learning. And But I always believe that there is such a connection between fashion and beauty, wellness, that is not being taken advantage to the full, the full potential. Because I always that I ambition to when every time I ask my clients what about the new beauty brand that I'm speaking with is like what do they wear I want to know what brands my my client wear it tells you so much how they right. want their clothes tailor how they want their stitching there is so much in fashion that we can learn about our persona I couldn't agree more and when I started Perfume Head, um, my main objective was the craftsmanship of France with the coolness of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up in, uh, I'm from Canada originally. I worked for a luxury retailer named Holt Renfrew. I was there for 15 years. And uh, it was an incredible experience for me because I was exposed to every fashion designer in the world, every major fashion house. So we would, you know, meet with these um, maisons and houses and you would be exposed to all that craftsmanship. You would be exposed to the time it took to make something and the hands, you know, the craftsmanship of it all. And I just love that. And I wanted to infuse that into Perfume Head. Because for me, craftsmanship, it's such a, a dying art, but it's something that is so special and we can't lose. And I would also say- I, I know, think it's dying because we cannot afford it, not because correct. it's not special, because it, it still make it very special. I have a few it, pieces from my grandmother, even a handkerchief, and look at it, and it's, a, it's art. Yes, yes. And the other thing I would say is, you talked about fashion and beauty. For me, everything is about beauty. I see beauty in everything from nature to clothes to music. Uh, for me, beauty means so much more than putting a product on your face or it, it's just, it, I wanted to create a beautiful brand that people would love, they would cherish, they would feel something when they wore it. And I think beauty is at the root of that. And I think beauty, sometimes is misconstrued with 
um, not about how it makes you feel, more about a product. And well, I think it, nowadays it's considered more an industry, but I agree yes. with you that the beauty is more about the combination of everything we put together or it works yes. or it doesn't work. Yes. And, you know, I, sometimes I wonder, like, there are some people that wear that outfit and it will never work on me. So beauty depends of each person. It's very individual. It's very individual. The same as yeah. a fragrance. Yeah. And I think that's why, going back to your original question, I think um, people are rediscovering or discovering the beauty of fragrance. Because there was a period where fragrance was very, you know, um, people did not appreciate it. Uh, you got into an elevator and somebody would sort of overwhelm you with scent. And what I love is when someone says to me, oh my God, I just, you know, I put on your fragrance and I feel so good. I People compliment me. Um, it's become part of who I am. Oh, That's, I love that. I yeah. And you're reminding me when you said overwhelming. I had this math teacher in high school. At, she was wearing poison. That was her. Oh, Dior poison. Yes. Oh my God. Every time that she will come in the hallway, everyone will hide because we know that the, the teacher was coming. Right. Smell her and a mile away right 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 yeah we don't like that we don't, uh, we don't. <laughs> and it, that's to me I, and believe me, i'm sure it tra traumatized more than one in my class correct. correct and that's where the memory of fragrance really sticks to yes. me that a memory of a bad fragrance is something that really sticks i mean my nose has become so sensitive to smell now you know you can really yeah Believe me, I, I don't think I remember any, the name of any of my classmates in that class, but I remember the scent of the perfume. Mm -hmm. Well, so true. when we, I started the podcast, I was talking about this very unique quality that you were talking about, about the ingredients and why a lot of people are not wearing perfume because of allergies, migraines, you name it. Why is this produced? Why people are having these reactions to perfume? Yeah, so the fragrance industry, um, there's sort of two worlds. There's the naturals, um, the extracts, and then there's synthetics. Mm -hmm. And what happens a lot of the time is that most fragrances are 95 to 100% synthetic. And if you don't have, um, if you don't know where those ingredients or where this, where it comes from, you don't really know what's in there. So of course you're going to get migraines. Of course, you're going to have allergies from it. 90 to 95% of our fragrances are natural. And one of, again, going back to product, I wanted to have access to the most beautiful natural ingredients in the world. Now, there are some ingredients that have to be synthetic now, musk, amber, they just don't exist anymore. Yeah. And so you, you saw a big shift from natural into more synthetics. And that you know, that can be good and it can be bad. The biggest existential threat to the to the fragrance industry is climate change. Mm. Um, because if you're using naturals that are grown, you know, flowers that are grown in France or India or South America, mm -hmm. and, and they're having droughts or they're having, you know, um, really extreme warm weather, that has a huge impact on your ingredients. As a result, a lot of brands have gone to more synthetic fragrances. Now, there are good synthetics and there are bad synthetics. I think that it's also a cheaper way in some cases of putting a fragrance together. Um, does it matter what you manufacture perfume? Um, I think it matters. So it's a really good question. So our ingredients come from all over the world. The oils are put together in France and then we pour in Los Angeles. So I like to say crafted in California, made in France. Uh, it's about the oil. It's about where the ingredients are coming from because in the fragrance, when you have a fragrance brand, you have to work with one of five to six fragrance houses. You just can't sort of go to... You know, you just can't go get ingredients willy nilly. You have to, 
you have to work with a fragrance house. So you have to vet the fragrance house. Where do they source their material? How do they source? Who do they work with? And then they work with the master perfumers and then bring the final oil to you that is then macerated. Um, we macerate for about four to six weeks and then that creates the final formula. How many alterations you had of each? Uh... It's a great question. Um, I know it's not easy. And and how did you say this is it? And did you try to do all of them together? I know there are too many questions I have. Sorry. Oh, no, it's a great question. So um, we started with seven. And in my mind, there were nine. I come from a family of seven kids with two parents. So okay. I wanted, so that's my little O to my family is the nine. So I started with seven. I'm your busy mom. I can... <laughs> my God, God bless her. She was yes. incredible. Um, and we started with seven. So I know this is hard to believe, but most of them had only two revisions. Really? We, we, you know, we worked a lot prepping. And so the final was not a surprise. We, we communicated a lot. We talked a lot. We looked at things a lot. But when it came down to the actual experience of smelling them, um, there was this incredible synergy. I can't even describe it. And but you, you feel it in your skin. You've got the chills that this is it. I really believe that. And um, I think there's a lot of love in our fragrances because I became very close with the perfumers. They're great friends of mine now. And so it was a beautiful experience in putting the fragrances together. But, you know, I'm also a big believer that if you don't get it right, sort of one, two revisions, I think you lose something. Yeah. I think when you start to- You, you, you started wrong. You To me, you scratch it and you start over. And one, let me ask you a question because I've been talking with a lot of founders uh, that they tell me I made a mistake uh, of talking to too many mothers or too many friends and yeah. everyone has an opinion. Yeah. And I always tell them, this is your brand. And it's not your mother's, it's, this is your brand, your, it's your beliefs. So if you put the ideas, it needs to come back to your idea. And if it's not right, right. for you, nothing else matters. You need to yeah. be able to stand by your brand. Correct. And if you, so I believe everything, I believe very much in my intuition. I also believe that when you get too many people commenting on things, you're kind of breaking down the molecular structure of an idea. Uh-huh. I and love it. I got to use that. I, that's yeah. really good. You're, you're, you're sort of playing with the universe in a way that you shouldn't. And it's important to have people's viewpoint, but you have to be the one to believe in it. Um, I know what I like. I know what I was trying to achieve. And I think it's through my years of experience. I think if I was younger, I would have been doubting myself. I think sort of, you know, the universe brought everything together at that time. And I was very confident in what I was looking for. And while opinions mattered, um, I felt my opinion was the most because I had to stand behind it. Absolutely. I'm the one that has to go out and sell it. What was important to me was when we launched at Violet Gray, that the customer, that was my sort of litmus test. Would the consumer like it? People I don't know, people I'm meeting for the first time. And that's when I really saw the momentum, the excitement. I haven't smelled like something like this before. Um, that's important to me. I don't, you know, I don't want to be arrogant, but, but going in and building, when you're building your own brand, you have to sort of be confident enough to know what you want to achieve. Uh, yes. You get, I always say it's like raising a child. I felt like the, one of the hardest thing of being pregnant or having a baby was everyone's giving you advice. Right. It's so hard. And it's like, at some point, say, enough. I follow my instinct. And if I want, I have questions, I go to the professional, ask questions. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, so the beauty industry was shaken up this year a little bit because of Mokra. A lot of smaller brands are concerned what how Mokra affects me. And I'm asking this question because honestly, I don't know how Mokra affects the fragrance industry. Um, I think it will affect it a little bit. I haven't seen or read anything that shows that it's going to... Um, I, you know, here's the thing. I went into this, when you start a new brand, here's what I would say. To, it's a very good question. I looked at everything very deliberately. So when you're building a brand from scratch and you have no history, you can decide, is this going to be a clean, are these going to be clean fragrances? Okay. What that's what, that, that was my next question that I want to attach it because in the beauty yeah. industry, you have Credo standards, uh, Sephora clean standards. In the fragrance, you have the same standards? To yes, be? you do. And then you have IFRA. So you also have to vet your fragrance house. What are their standards? Um, fragrance is a very mysterious industry if you, if you fall into sort of that trap. You have to work with really high quality companies, quality people. There's a lot of innovation happening in fragrance right now. A lot of how um, the notes and the, the, the fragrances are, are extracted. There's lots of innovation. There's a lot of green science happening in fragrance right now. So I think an industry that was sort of falling behind has really caught up. And this all comes through the fragrance houses. But I built the brand knowing that I wanted it to be clean. I wanted it to use technology and science in, in how we put our ingredients together. So I made sure that we were IFRA certified, Credo, Sephora. We You can do that going in. I think the challenge with a lot of brands that have been in the industry for, you know, five to 10 years is they have to go back and redo yeah. things. Yes. That That's to me is where the impact is. So what you're saying basically is trust your instinct, make sure who you work with, that they are the real. Very people. important. And, and just follow your gut. Follow your gut and do your homework. It's yes. um, do your home. I mean, I spent four years now that's not four years consistently because I had a full-time job, but it was four years of, I wanted the best bottle. I wanted the same bottle manufacturer that Chanel uses. And while I've been in the industry, I'm a nobody to them. So I had to really do my research really prove myself to these companies because I wanted to work with the best. If my competition is Frederick Mall, Byredo, um, Killian, Creed, then I have to create a product that can sit next to that, that can smell as beautiful or more beautiful than that. I'm a small fish in a big pond. I have to actually work harder. So I really did my homework. And there is a bit of a myth, I think, in the beauty industry, and I'm sure you've seen this, where people think that because, you know, uh, a celebrity has done a brand that it can happen overnight, you can be uber successful, huge amount of work, heavy lifting. And magic doesn't exist. It sure doesn't. And many times, if something that happens, it will be very short-lived. Correct. So want, I always say, you either creating a brand that is the infinite game is a legacy or you have a collection of products that you're selling. Correct. So Mike, I talk, it's so funny you're saying this. Um, I am building a forever brand. I am building a hundred year brand. And there is a big, and if you don't understand what kind of brand you're building, you're in for some big disappointments. So there is nothing wrong with building a brand that you can build really quickly, sell, make, but it will not be around in 10 to 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So when you Im imagine this brand, ambition this brand, immediately so you thought, I want my brand to be in this store, in this store, or is something that it came later? Not at all. It was all, it was all part of the homework I did. You, and I, I, you know, you've worked with a lot of brands. I've worked with a lot of brands. A lot of brands jump into it without doing their homework. Mm -hmm. And then they spend a lot of money with people, with packaging, and then they hit a wall and then they have to redo because they're learning some very hard lessons. I think I've been extremely fortunate in my career to 
have had incredible mentors to be working with incredible companies. So I've had a firsthand view of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. And I knew that I wanted to be in Bergdorf's. I knew that the first store I wanted to launch in was Violet Gray because it was in Los Angeles. It's down the street from where I live. I could go and in how did you go about it? You just went to Violet Gray to say, hey, I want this. I want you to have it in my No, I, I tracked down. Um, I had known Sarah Brown from being in the industry. I was a huge fan of what Cassandra Gray had done with Violet Gray. I, I did hunt them down. I sent them a presentation and I told them that I wanted to launch this brand with them. I told them that they were the I, I love that you said that I hand them down because that's a work of a founder. That's right. what the founder needs to do. You need to do what you need to do to get where you need to Correct. be. Listen, a lot of doors get slammed in your face. You have to, you know, you really toughen up, but you can't give up. You have to, oh. if you, you know, I'm doing this, I would say, um, this is, I've had about four chapters in my career. This is another chapter, but you have to really go into this with your sort of fighting gloves on, determined, passion. You've got to have passion doing this. Uh, you don't want to take no for an answer and you get a lot of no's, but you have to be perseverant on, on yeah, doing don't, this. Don't burn bridges. 100% don't burn bridges. Never. Very but important. Uh, but Very important. at the beginning, you're nobody. So you need a lot of proof of concept too. So Correct. so just to that point, um, I had a history of fashion. I worked for Benefit Cosmetics, mm -hmm. Paracone MD, Too Faced. I, you know, so I went into this like I have experience. Uh, nobody knew who I was in fragrance. Nobody cared. I had to prove myself. Yeah. And you prove yourself through hard work, through passion through conveying what you want to achieve with people. And people are very generous, but people don't want their time wasted either. But also people want you to see that you show up. It's Correct. being part of an industry. It's being part of you who, and in Spanish, we have, me, my audience always hear that I always say the same thing that we, I say in Spanish is, dime con quien andas y te diré con quien eres. Tell me who you hung out with and I tell you who you are. Oh, wow. I love that. And this goes to me is something that I use for all my clients, like how you position your brand. You need to composition it between who you want to hang out, hang out with those founders too, make friends because honestly, founders collaborate. So Correct. they are not competing. No, don't stop right. with that. Those are my competition. You can be your competition in their market, but they can be your biggest allies. I agree. But you know, they're in the beauty industry. Um, that is that can be lacking. I think there's a new. I think there's a new group of people who are much more collaborative. I love helping people. I think you love helping people. Yes, I do. Um, you know, if you've been through an experience where someone hasn't helped you or given you a hand, you can become jaded. But I always put myself in somebody else's shoes, and I'm thinking, well, what if I was asking that question, and and I was like, I'm, I don't want you're my competition. I can't talk to you. I think that's very unfair, and I think it, it gives a bad impression of, you know, we're all here to help each other. They're exactly. We have one life, and it's all about karma. Um, Correct. You. And yeah, I have those bad experiences all the time. But you know, guess what? karma is back and sometimes they come back to you um, correct and you i don't what? think you can ever be jaded that's my other thing be optimistic be positive um be kind to people number one to your point do not burn bridges yeah it's a industries are small everybody knows each other and, and follow your gut i mean i yeah. my instinct never never fail me I even agree. with people that i said I, no, I cannot just reject them because I had this feeling and I try and I try and I force it, always yeah. end up wrong. And that's the opportunity. That's when I really burn bridges. Yeah, when I, things go bad. If I wouldn't even go there, nothing will happen. Yep. You know, the other thing I would just add to that is I think a lot of founders go out looking for money with an idea. And I think a better way to approach it is 
try to save some money or you, you need to be the first investor in your own company. Yep. And I see so many people looking for money off an idea as opposed to sort of putting your money where your mouth is and really, Absolutely. and, and it will, it'll make you make better decisions. It will help you focus. It will cut out a lot of noise when it's your own money. And then as you sort of have proof of concept, you start getting some momentum, then go out and raise money. But I'm a big believer, try to do it on your own as much as you can. Now that can be from family or whoever, but when you have a, a seat at the table and a stake in the game, it makes for a much better um, product and brand. Yeah, and the brands that I see that... Some brands are you're not ever gonna born successful unless you are a celebrity and that you put tons of money into it. And again, I don't know how long those brands are gonna stay around. Who knows? I wish them well. But for someone who starts from scratch and having a brand that unknown, this is gonna be a marathon. So you need to make sure that you create sustainable strategies to keep alive and to create that legacy. But at the same time, that you align yourself with the right people, that you have a team. 100%. Even your PR person, people that you feel, I always say you need to have an accountant that you feel like you can share everything with. Correct. You cannot um, have an accountant that you're afraid to talk to. Correct. I um, I've been very fortunate because I've worked at several companies and I've collected people along the way. So we have a very small team, but they all come with, I have a relationship with them. I've known some of them for 20 years. Um, they have great experience. It's practical experience. Um, and it just makes for a better, just a better everything. Uh, you know, surrounding yourself with the right people is really, really important. And people who want to see you win, people who, you know, have your back. Yeah, they're your cheerleaders. They are not sure. there for the money. They are there. Sure. And, and that's something we discussed before all about service providers. There are many kind of service providers. Find someone who align with you, with your budget, with your beliefs, but also that they are willing to grow with you. Correct. And I think... Um, We've both worked with a lot of service providers or seen a lot of service providers who want to help and want to be involved. To me, it's all about execution. Yep. So I can't afford to just have someone come on board to tell me what they think I should do. If I'm bringing someone in where I have limited resources, they actually have to be able to do something. Yeah, and, and there are too many big ideas out there. If you can, you want to create a photo shoot for, with, from helicopter, and you need to make sure you have a budget for that. Correct. So that doesn't help me when I'm just trying to put sort of juice in a bottle, right? Yeah. It's very important because a lot of people think that they have to go really big. To me, it's kind of like every day is the building. It's not sort of one big thing that's going to change everything. It's what you're doing every day. It's how you're interacting with your customer every day. When I send out um, a package through our e-commerce, I write a personal note to everybody. And, but it's it's important to me because I know what I would want to receive if I was on the other end. Yeah. So it's just, like it's those small things that turn into big moments. It's not yeah. big moments that sort of- it, It's all about them. that experience. Like I get, for example, I love how Chanel, they used to get the little yeah. box that, ah, it makes yes. me feel special, like the little bag. And don't we all, I mean, we all want to feel special. We all want to feel good. Yeah. Um, life is tough. Life yeah, is tough. Life is tough. So, and every time that you buy something, I think we give it for granted. And when everything that we buy should be something special, it's a gift to ourselves. Yes, I agree. Well, Daniel, Love your dog in the background. <laughs> thank you. It's <laughs> my puppy. It's hard to control, but I uh, thank you everyone for being here today, Daniel. So glad thank you so much, Lana. I really it. appreciate it. And this was an incredible talk. And you guys, I will see you next week with more coffee number five. Find everything you need at larashmoisman.com or in the episode notes right below. Don't forget to subscribe. 
was so good to have you here today. See you next time. Catch you on the flip side. Ciao, ciao.